United States Olympic Committee. Development, Enhancement, and Sustainability of Expert Performance in Sport Conference. 2008. Richard A. Schmidt, Ph.D. Principles for the Development of Skilled Actions. Implications for Training in Athletics. This original lecture was about two hours long, and this are the audio notes. How does the brain work? More learning involves plugging the right things in the right order. Is practicing something that you know how to do a waste of time? According to cigar tobacco rolling research, no. That is, after 10 million times, which took about 20 years, efficiency and effectiveness of cig cigar tobacco rolling improved. Schmidt's point. Learning never really stops nor ends. It's just not so obvious later during learning phases, as opposed to early in the learning phases. As an aside, Smith actually starts his lecture pointing out that there has been a lot of motor learning research on college sophomores and not Olympic level athletes, which could suggest more research needs to be done on Olympic athletes. And most of his theories are derived from examples of very controlled labs. That is, universities, colleges, and other controlled environments. Or, non-real-world Olympic examples. How do we learn skills? The answer is, practice. How do we determine who learns more via practice methods? Answer. Control or controlled lab tests or research which compares new method of practice with old method of practice. How do we find out which practice method is better over the long term or who learns more? Answer. Compare and contrast outcomes over determined time. That is, three weeks, six weeks, or twelve weeks. This idea suggests that there are, may be immediate learning that shows significant improvement early in learning phase and that there may be much more delayed learning in later new phases. Or, one method may show quicker results with shorter or less learning overall, and another method may show delayed learning and longer or more robust learning over long term. Coaches should be concerned with long term learning versus short term learning or long term development versus short term development, which may be contrary to what parents and athletes want. Old or new methods may be better for temporary or delayed learning or application during competition or practice. Coaches should be concerned with long-term or delayed learning and application of learning during competition. So I'm just going to recover some of that information because there was a lot of um, maybe nine or ten points. I'm just going to kind of review them quickly within this time frame here, maybe less than a minute. So there, the idea that I picked up from most of this information that he just discussed was there could be better ways and more effective ways in order to, you know, have your practices and or teach athletes specific skills. And the idea behind that is which ones are they and how do we determine which one is going to be best? The other idea that I think is very important is athletes may learn something that has uh, an effect on training and or competition quickly, but in the long run it may not actually help them get better. And sometimes I use this example as a headlock in wrestling, not specifically how quickly or how fast they learn it, but the other side of it is they can, as kid wrestlers, basically 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds, they can learn headlocks. And they can win every single match with that. And, you know, a lot of times young people just believe the outcome is just for me to win. Maybe not necessarily to learn and develop. Thus, if they only learn one skill and they just, and their coaches and, and their parents and their teammates or anybody around them isn't encouraging them to do more, they can get to high school and now they've only got maybe one or two skills mastered, which is going to kind of set them up for a rude awakening because you can not only have a headlock and be successful in college or the next level beyond that. The last concept is what most coaches and teachers always stress, learning never really stops. In other words, you can continue to learn if you want to. There's an adage or a saying that goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. 
And I, I once said that to a friend of mine, Tadaki Hada, who was a two-time Olympic coach actually for Mexico and for the USA. And he said this in response to you can't teach an old dog two tricks. You can't teach an old dog new tricks unless that new dog wants to learn. So the, the idea there is never learning never really stops until people don't want to learn anymore. So I think that's important too. That whole headlock example, that child maybe stopped learning because they were having a lot of success with that headlock. But as we progress and teach and develop our athletes, we've got to continually be feeding them information and education that's going to help them progress, develop, and ultimately reach their maximum potential. The final concept that I'll touch on is I alluded to it a little bit in all of those, uh, I guess, examples is sometime learning, it takes a little bit of time, whereas most uh, people are in this society, or all societies at this point probably now, uh, it's like the computer age and the information age and the, you know, immediate gratification age where they want to learn how to do it right now, today, this second, you know, but really learning is a long-term process, so it's not what you can learn today that's actually going to help you become a state champion tomorrow. Metaphorically, today could mean three weeks, 12 weeks, nine weeks, six weeks, you know, 16 weeks, 100 weeks. And ultimately, you want to keep that long-term vision in mind when you're teaching skills and to communicate that to athletes. When we're teaching skills, you may get it today or it may be next week or it may be the next month. We have to continue to build on that foundation of learning consistently. How do I maximize learning or organize practice to maximize learning? Answers. Random or blacked, blocked practice. Example, same skill over and over repetitiously or practicing randomly. Example, skill one, skill two, skill three. Ensuring you never practice same skill consecutively or continuously. Who learns more via blocked or random practice methods of learning? Lab tests suggest that Early learning may be less important for both methods, that is, random or blocked, until transfer test or transfer phase, or competitions. So the transfer phase could actually be the competition, as an example. Transfer means you learned it actually over the cor according to the time period that you um, allotted for it, and then in the competition or the transfer, what you were learning in practice transfers over to the actual test or the competition or the evaluation. Transfer test or phase is time lapse of predetermined time, that is 10 days, 20 days, 40 days, to see how much was acquired and learned after various practice methods. In this case, blocked versus random. Smith's research suggests random methods are better for competition and not better for practice. That is, long-term effects of random method training prepare athletes better for competitions, which may not be evident or visible in practice. The idea here is to is counter to what most coaches have been taught and learned. Most athletes and coaches are taught it must be perfect in practice. So I'm going to stop right there because that, although that was a shorter message, piece of information, discussion, extremely important. I'm just going to read that last part over again. Most coaches and athletes are taught it must be perfect in practice. And theoretically, that's, you know, we've all been taught that, right? In theory, if you do it in practice, kind of, well, the difference between that concept and what I'm going to say next is there's two different points. One is nine times out of ten, practice is never going to be like the competition because the stress involved with competition and practice are completely different. They're, you know, you're repetitiously doing things over and over again, and they're nine times out of ten, there isn't going to be a referee, there's not going to be a crowd, and you're maybe not going to exhibit or create the same type of uh, self-imposed stress that you would for a competition. So that's, that's the one. The other uh, idea is that practices very rarely have uh, situations that only happen once. In other words, when you're in a match, that, 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 you know, that action may only happen once and you've got to be prepared for it. And then a different set of circumstances happen. And then a different set of circumstances happen. And then a different second. So the idea there is, you know, a competition is so random, whereas practice, practice itself implies we're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Very often in competitions, you know, you may, especially if someone's a very, very good, astute competitor, they're probably not going to do the same thing twice in a match. Why? Because you, you're, you've read that situation, you see it coming. So those are just examples of how, you know, what actually happens in practice may never actually happen in competition. So we, you know, for me, and, you know, based on the information that I've learned from this 
author is you actually have to design practices that are going to be very similar to the competitions so when you have random versus um, blocked practice random practice based on this research will prepare you better for competition because competitions are random blocked implies doing the same thing over and over and over and over again with the same set of circumstances random implies more like a competition where things may happen once and then they may not actually happen again so I, I just stopped to really review that section because I think that's the crux of this talk to me specificity of practice principle Learning is maximum when practice conditions most closely mimic test conditions and the test in this case could be the competition. Smith suggests there are many exceptions to this principle and in his last example this principle is violated. What is it about random practice methods that makes it better for learning? Hypothesis number one. The act of doing something different on every attempt may closer mimic real competition. Hypothesis number two. The predictability factor or making athletes do something different also closely mimics real competitions. Interfering with performance during practicing by having athletes mimic real competitions better prepares athletes for real competitions. So practice may not look perfect via random practice method and will better prepare athletes for real competitions. Random versus block practice effects has been studied with mental math handwriting in children, various real-world sports skills, logical operations and electronics, and many lab tests tasks. The idea that you force people to do something different appears to be why a random method has a more robust long-term learning effect. Repetitions without repetitiveness. That is, maximize number of practice reps. Do not practice same skill immediately after another or same type of uh, skill or domain or discipline or whatever you're doing. Example, A, 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 A. Just do A one million times in a row. Randomize practice among several skills in space practice episodes as widely as possible. Challenge could be too many competitions may deter coaches and athletes, parents, because robust learning effect through random method takes time and patience. When competitions nowadays are every weekend, which may not allow enough time spacing for learning to happen. It's like taking a test every week in math or English or science on the material you just learned the week before. In other words, nowadays when athletes have time to learn or develop skills if they are consistently tested. Or when do athletes have time to learn or develop skills if they are consistently tested? So just going to give another quick review. That's uh, that random versus Black practice is a complete paradigm shift for me. It was, you know, seven or eight years ago when I first heard of this, but instinctively and intuitively, if I think about how a competition goes, just like that last brief summary, it makes a lot more sense. Now, the challenge is very new athletes or very new students in sport or specific sports skills, I think it's almost, you almost have to do it in a blocked form where they're doing the same thing repetitively so that they can get the motion down. As soon as they understand the motion and the movement pattern, then I think you've got to randomize it so they're not doing it a hundred times in a row because what happens if the person puts their hand over there now, but they've only done it when the hand has been in this position. And that's, for me, that's the reason why random practice is a little bit better. And then I think you all, for me, I've always done situations where you put the athletes for, as an example of a random practice, you put the athletes in six or seven or eight or nine or ten different variations of the same thing and then you just put them in any old kind of situation that has nothing to do with the skill that you're doing so they can quickly understand that it isn't going to be the way that you taught it in a competition and they're going to have to be flexible which is a mental skill if you will they're going to have to be flexible and adapt and adjust and change on the spot but I think you've got to communicate that to the athletes and you've got to coach and teach in that style as well retrieval practice Practicing obtaining items from memory, that is, finding same book and library on several occasions. Random practice forces retrieval practice. Blocked practices do not force students to retrieve, nor construct, nor figure out right moves, because same moves are done over and over and over again. Expanding retrieval practice. 
increasing in time intervals between successive repetitions of skill, that is, spaced practice. Early on, spacing should be less to learn master movement. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier about if it's a brand new skill, there may be no spacing at all because they've never even done that movement pattern before. As they develop the movement pattern, you need to, I think it's important to move into a more of a spacing method where they do that skill, then they do another skill, then they do another skill, then they actually have to go all the way back in their brain, reconstruct what has happened earlier from when they learned it, and do it again. Another way to say the same thing is, um, or say the, the, the idea of this principle is adding 1 plus 1 equals 2. Well, if you do that a hundred times in a row, have you learned math? Maybe you learned how to add one plus one is two, but typically on a math test, if, if it's basic arithmetic like adding, it'll be one plus one, six plus seven, three plus nine, nine plus eighteen, etc. So they children, students have to reconstruct what the actual numbers are, and they've got to you know do mental math and you know basically try to figure out the, the answer to the question. Whereas if that 1 plus 1 example is done 9, 10, 12, 13, 14 times in a row, what have they actually learned? Have they learned anything? And that's a question I think I started to ponder about 9, about 8, 9 years ago when I started understanding and learning all this information. Practice first test performance. Practice does not necessarily transfer to game, especially if highly blocked practices are used. Then game is highly random. Feedback. Information provided about quality of actions, knowledge of results, meeting goals. Besides practice, some say feedback is the most important factor in learning skills. How do we use feedback as a coach to manage effectively? Summary feedback. Which is delayed and after a group of skill executions? Seems to be most effective per Schmidt's research. Instant feedback is really the opposite of summer feedback and this feedback is given after every skill execution. Studies show if or it is less effective than summer feedback. Continuous feedback gives feedback during skill execution and is less effective than summer feedback or learning per Schmidt's research. Challenge. Feedback types all show significant practice performances. That is, athletes perform skills well in practice. However, summary feedback shows significant better and more effective game performances, but less better practice performances. Desirable difficulties. Design practices to produce desirable difficulties. That is, black practices are easier because the athletes repeat same skill over again, while random practices force athletes to reproduce game-like situations that have to be anticipated and require a deeper level of thought and learning. If practices are more difficult, learning takes longer, but is more effective. And feedback, that is continuous or instant, may give answers to students without them having to think or reproduce right move, skill, or answer. Caveat, these tests are done in lab, not fields of play for sports. So coaches must test these theories of learning. Bandwidth feedback, create a bandwidth of correctness. That is, if the skill execution is within the band of correctness, you make no corrections. And if skill execution error is too great to tolerate, you give feedback. As performance gets better, the bandwidth decreases because you demand more from them and vice versa for novices. This method decreases the amount of feedback given and isolates larger skill execution errors. Highly frequent feedback can create a reliance that may not be there on game day, and it creates variations in skill execution after every attempt, which may never allow the athlete to get a feel for the technique. Giving feedback after several skill executions reduces the athlete's reliance on coach, gives athletes opportunity to show on average what the skill level attained, and reduces feedback. So this was, I'm going to just briefly go over that again. This was something else that I picked up almost a decade ago with regard to uh, feedback. I guess it is a decade ago. I started listening to this stuff, uh, these, these seminars, like 2007, 2008, although I'd read several books. Actually, you know, hearing and seeing the authors that created those books and all those articles, completely different category. Anyhow, uh, what I got from the, uh, the understanding and the application of doing different types of feedback, again, I'm just going to quickly read them uh, in reverse order. Frequent or highly frequent feedback, bandwidth feedback. 
continuous feedback, instant feedback, and delayed feedback. Those are all variations on a theme. And for me, once I understood that giving feedback after every single execution may not be the most effective way, it, it, it made sense in as much as we don't know what the average uh, of the executions are if we if we give feedback after every single one a we we don't know what the average skill is per that athlete what does it look like over a number of 10 or 15 tries after 10 or 15 tries then we can say you know what after you've done it so many times this is what i'm seeing and your hand is here yada 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 in terms of explaining precisely the movement that you've seen when we do it only or when we give feedback over one or two or three tries after every single one uh, a, the athlete never has any time to reflect on what they've done, and B, like he was suggesting, they become so reliant on getting immediate feedback right away, we can create a scenario where we've taught them how to have immediate gratification, where the delayed uh, feedback actually teaches them how to delay their gratification. So there, there are a lot of different principles, I think, in effect there, but understanding what type and how to give feedback, I think, is critical in terms of athlete development. Transfer, appropriate processing. Organized practice, so process is appropriate for transfer. And transfer, again, can mean the test or the game or the competition. Performances are trained. Avoid practices, methods that learner can bypass important information. Processing operations such as block practice, guided practice, highly frequent feedback, concurrent feedback. All of those methods of practice boost performance during practice and are terrible for transfer on game day, primarily because learner is helped too much or and does not have to reproduce process or structures on own to execute skills. Learning to generalize. This concept suggests learning then mastering a motor program's for skill can be variable. Example, swinging a golf club or baseball bat for distance and or speed of pitch. Once general motor program is mastered, variations are also scaled for variable distance and speed. As an aside, variations or variable practices are better for game day because exact same thing rarely, if ever, happens. That is, usually skills are varied and athletes have to adjust and adapt for them. However, super high reps, like a free throw practice in basketball, increase effectiveness due to fixed rules of game. Challenge. Not many sports skills offer this specialized opportunity. Self-feedback or subjective simulation forces learners to process own information and evaluation of skill execution and detect own errors or correctness. Smith's research suggests self-feedback helps students learn and retain skills because they are forced to process and recreate processes of how and why they executed skills. Self-feedback coupled with coach's feedback increases productive communication between athlete and coach, plus strengthens bonds and trust too. A couple of ideas I think that are really important too. So the idea of transfer appropriate processing where you're actually going to create practices uh, where you expect that it's going to take time for the athletes to learn it so they're, they're not perfect in practice is probably contrary to everything that you've taught and learned with regard to teaching and coaching of athletic skills and or movements and for that matter probably even teaching. The idea that we help the athletes along with every aspect of movement and or understanding could be a, uh, a mistake because we don't actually give the, the uh, learner an opportunity to learn. Does that make sense? So if you, what's one plus one, it's two. If we keep giving the athletes the answer and you, we keep putting the athlete's hand in the right place and we keep every second of every practice, now they have not learned to do the move. So I think it's important to understand that what happens in practice may not necessarily happen in the competition because the practice is not like the competition. So the, I, I restated that idea, but if we make the competition and the practice very similar, it does actually start to mimic what we do in practice and in competition. And it takes a longer time term for the people or the athletes or the learners to learn that material so it can take up to three to six to seven or eight or nine or ten months if the athletes understand that on the front end and your coaching philosophy implies learning is going to take time and patience uh, the athletes will understand that and they won't be so um, you know eager to master this stuff in one day the other side of the coin which I, I think we stated in the last um, segment there was because there are so many frequent competitions or 
coaches may actually schedule too frequent competitions that makes it again very hard to actually learn so if you space your competitions out now you give the athletes two to three weeks to actually learn the material and then there's another competition and you give them another two to three weeks to learn so maybe by the fourth or fifth competition they've got a mastery of a lot of different skills however if you have a competition every single weekend how is it possible for the athletes to learn something in two to three days then have a competition and learn something again in two to three days I think that's impossible and that's something I think coaches actually need to really understand and take a look at Bob Bjork quote stamping it in which means doing something over and over again to master it challenge most competitions have variations during game which are not practiced summary and Q&A where is the line for blocked and random practice have the practice be blocked till new skill can be executed then switch to random New skills or new movements will fall into bracket category for novices. If test or game is random, so should practice or training be. Space reps could also replicate random practice because students have to recreate process to execute skill versus doing something a hundred times in a row. In this way, students never have to reconstruct or reproduce processes of skill execution. What does transfer between drills and sports skills. Smith's research suggested there's very little transfer for drills, simulation machines, and part whole transfer. That is, most skills are unique and tend to need the actual game or whole skill taught to be executed under game conditions. Caveat, it's difficult to ascertain what skills transfer from drills or simulations and or there's very little research to support transfer claims. What is the transferability with modifying or changing a skill versus acquiring a skill? It may be hard to modify or change a skill and may be easier to start from scratch and teach a new skill, likely because students' motor program for old skill prevents modification. Caveat, I believe it's important to teach learned skills correctly from the early acquisition phase because it takes a long time to unlearn motor programs. When do you change from black to random practice? Research needs to be done on elite to Olympic level athletes to answer many of the questions asked during this Q&A. Most research has been done on college students during biomechanics or similar classes at universities. As an aside, many USA basketballers and Brazilian footballers learn and master sport on playgrounds without a lot of standard coaching. This suggests students may be able to learn from each other, learn during games, and use variable and random training to master sport. Caveat, those sports per country are enormously popular, highly televised, and extremely financial, rewarding, and motivating. So a lot of information I think was appropriate and applicable for coaches with this particular talk with regard to how we teach and how we coach random versus black practice and the importance of one versus the other and why one may or may not prepare an athlete much better for a competition in as much as most competitions are random. They're not the same thing over and over again. The other side of the coin is when you're learning very new skills, it may be important to have it be blocked in terms of doing it over and over and over again. As soon as you get the movement pattern in my mind down, then I think you've got to move into more random things that are actually going to happen in competition. That took me probably about a year and a half to really, really, really start to understand that. And even now, I have to catch myself in a practice with the whole feedback scenario, right? I think it's so instinctive if an athlete asks you a question, what, well, is this, this the right way? And they do one of them. Well, we got to say, why don't you do three or four or five of them and let me see what it looks like from several different angles. That way, they again, we're starting to teach them not to get that immediate gratification and see if they can replicate or imitate the same thing that they've done over and over again. And I suggest very new skills are very hard to do that, especially when they're learning them. If they master it right away, then they'll do it the same time over and over again. And that's what we're actually looking for. We're looking for them to do several examples prior to them getting feedback. I, I think, again, I think this is one of the better uh, explanations of why and how we should be doing things. I think all these talks are excellent, but if, uh, again, I suggest listening to these several times, up to at least 10 times, so that you can really get a, a very good grasp of how this works, and then actually go and do it when you're teaching and coaching, and then you can evaluate how, it, how it's effective for your uh, philosophy and or style.